Prior to our break, we discussed memory mapping. Now we're ready to look at some typical memory operations involving data storage and retrieval. Before a master device can store data in memory or retrieve data from memory, it must address a memory location and specify the type of data transfer to be performed. Four types of data transfers can be executed. As noted in an earlier study unit, bus control lines C1 and C0 specify the type of data transfer to be performed. For example, if a master device wishes to retrieve data from memory, it specifies a data I transfer. Here's an example of a typical data I transfer. The CPU initiates the transfer by clearing the C0 and C1 lines and by asserting its master sync signal. The CPU also places a memory address on the unibus. The memory unit recognizes this as its address and responds to the data I transfer as follows. First, our memory unit selects the storage location containing the data word addressed by the processor. Then it reads the data word from this storage location and temporarily holds the word in its buffer register. Notice that as the data word is read from storage, the contents of the addressed location are changed to zeros. This is a characteristic common to all core memory units. They are destructive readout devices. The data word has now been read from its storage location. Next, the memory unit takes the word from its buffer register and places it on the unibus. The memory unit also issues its slave sync, or SSYN signal, to inform the processor that the data word is available on the bus. The processor responds by bringing in the data word. Finally, the memory unit performs a restore cycle in order to retain the original data word. During this restore cycle, the memory takes the data word held in its buffer register and rewrites the word into the addressed core location. This completes the data I operation. Remember, this restore cycle is necessary in destructive readout devices such as core memory. If it is not performed, the original data will be lost. That completes our discussion of a typical data I. Now, let's look at data IP transfers. A master device selects the data IP transfer if data is to be read from memory and can then be discarded. For example, the master device may wish to read a word from memory, increment the word by two, and then store the new value in the original memory location. Let's see how memory responds during a typical data IP transfer. The CPU specifies a data IP transfer by asserting C0 and by clearing C1. It also issues a master sync signal and places a memory address on the unibus. A memory unit recognizes the address placed on the bus. Since a data IP has been requested, the memory unit locates the word addressed by the CPU, reads the word from its storage location, and loads this word into its buffer register. Next, the memory unit places the word onto the bus and issues a slave sync signal. This signal informs the master device that the address data word is on the bus. That completes the read cycle. Because a data IP has been specified by the master device, the memory bypasses its restore cycle. If it happens to be a core memory, the addressed location now contains all zeros. Up to this point, we've been talking about the two ways of reading data from memory. We can perform either a data I or a data IP transfer. Note that a data I transfer involves two cycles. During the first cycle, data is read from the addressed memory location. The second cycle is then used to restore the data back into the original location so that it will not be lost. The data IP transfer, on the other hand, involves just one cycle, a read cycle. The restore cycle is bypassed. As a result, the total core memory cycle time is reduced by approximately 50% over that required for a data I transfer. Now, let's look at memory operations involving data storage. A master device specifies a data O transfer if it wishes to store or write a full word into an addressed memory location. 
Let's see how memory responds to the master's data O request. During a data O transfer, the processor places a data word on the bus, along with an address indicating where that data word is to be stored. The processor also clears the C0 line, asserts the C1 line, and issues its master sync signal. If core memory has been addressed, the memory unit first performs a read operation in order to clear the addressed memory location. The core memory unit can then proceed to its write cycle. During the write cycle, the core memory unit takes the data word from the bus and loads it into its buffer register. The memory unit also issues a slave sync signal to inform the CPU that it has the data word. The memory unit then completes the data O transfer by storing or writing the data word into the storage location addressed by the CPU. Before going any further, let's briefly compare data O transfers involving core memories and semiconductor memories. As we have just seen, a data O transfer requires separate read and write cycles in a core memory unit. A read cycle must be performed to clear the addressed core location. Then the write cycle is performed to store the words supplied by the master device. In contrast, semiconductor memory does not have to be cleared prior to storing new data. Hence, the read cycle is bypassed and the memory unit proceeds directly to the write cycle in order to store the data words supplied by the master device. Our fourth and final type of memory operation involves data OB transfers. A master device specifies a data OB transfer if it wishes to store a byte rather than a full word of data. The memory operations for a data OB are the same as those we describe for a data O. However, a single byte is stored instead of a 16-bit word. Remember, the address supplied by the master device designates whether a high byte or a low byte is to be stored. Here, the CPU has placed an even address on the Unibus. Consequently, a low byte is written into the corresponding memory location. On the other hand, the CPU places an odd address on the Unibus if it wished to store a high byte in memory. Well, that completes our discussion of typical memory operations involving data storage and retrieval. Now, let's take a look at the various kinds of memories that can be used in a PDP-11 system. PDP-11 memories can be grouped into three general categories. Ferrite core memories, semiconductor memories, and read-only memories, or ROMs. Because of our Unibus, Memories with different operating characteristics, speeds, and storage capacities can be used in the same system. For example, in a PDP-1145 system, the bulk of addressable memory may consist of banks of core memory, semiconductor memory, or a combination of both. In addition, one or more read-only memories, or what we call ROMs, can be added to the system. Each ROM may be pre-programmed with a loading routine which automatically reads larger programs from an input device and transfers the programs into core or semiconductor memory. Now, let's take a closer look at each type of PDP-11 memory. We'll begin with core memories. All core memories are destructive readout devices. In other words, if a core location contains a 1, its state will be switched to a zero during the read cycle. Hence, in order to preserve the original data, it is necessary to follow up the read cycle with a restore cycle. This restore cycle returns the core to its original state, which in this case is a one. Core memory is packaged in individual units or memory banks that contain their own read-write circuits and address select logic. These memory units are available in different sizes. Some of the more common memory sizes used in PDP-11 systems are 8K, 16K, 32K, and 64K words of storage. 8K banks of memory are addressed as shown here. Address bits 14 and 15 select the desired memory bank. In this example, bits 14 and 15 have selected the first 8K bank of memory. Words within our selected memory bank are then addressed by bits 1 through 13. The least significant address bit, bit 0, 
permits us to select a high byte or low byte within this word location. If we are using the expanded 18-bit address and are working with 16K memory banks, address bits 15, 16, and 17 designate the desired memory bank. In this case, we've selected the second 16K bank of memory. Address bits 1 through 14 are now used for selecting the word location within our memory bank. As before, address bit 0 designates a high byte or low byte during data OB transfers. Each memory bank has a device decoder which is hardwired to recognize a unique block of addresses. In this case, our decoder has been wired to respond to all addresses that begin with 01. When a memory address is placed on the bus, one of the memory banks decodes and recognizes its device address. The balance of the address is then decoded within that memory bank in order to select a specific word or byte location. In PDP-11 systems, it is possible to take a series of memory addresses and alternate these addresses between two banks of core memory. In other words, the first memory bank would recognize addresses 0, 4, and 10, while the second memory bank would recognize addresses 2, 6, and 12. This process is called memory interleaving and is our next topic for discussion. Interleaving is accomplished by swapping certain address bits in the memory's decoding network. For example, bits 1 and 14 are swapped if we wish to interleave a pair of 8K memory banks. Note that in this example, we've interleaved the first and second banks of memory. Now, let's look at memory interleaving in a little more detail. At the left, we have a series of addresses issued by a master device. In the center, we have the corresponding addresses decoded by memory after we have swapped address bits 1 and 14. Note that addresses 0, 4, and 10 select word locations within memory bank 0, whereas addresses 2, 6, and 12 select word locations within memory bank number 1. In other words, memory banks 0 and 1 have been interleaved. Note also that interleaving is completely transparent to the master device. The master still addresses memory as if it were one continuous storage area. Memory interleaving permits us to overlap core memory read and restore cycles. By overlapping these cycles, we can reduce program execution time significantly. For example, one memory bank can be performing its read operation while the other interleaved memory bank is completing its restore operation. In this example, three interleaved memory cycles can be performed in the time that it normally takes for just two memory cycles. There are a few restrictions that must be noted when we're interleaving memory. For example, if we're working with 8K banks of memory, we can only interleave in consecutive 16K segments. Therefore, if our system has 24K of core memory, only the first 16K of memory can be interleaved. The remaining 8K cannot be interleaved. On the other hand, if our system has 32K of core memory, the first 16K segment can be interleaved, and the second 16K segment can also be interleaved. Parity generation and detection logic is included on some of the memories that are used in PDP-11 systems. This expands the memory word size from 16 to 18 bits. Notice that the bits are now numbered 0 through 17. Bit 17 provides even or odd parity for the high byte. Bit 16 provides even or odd parity for the low byte. The parity bits are generated when data is stored or written into memory. Remember, to store data, we must execute either a data O or a data OB transfer. When the data is retrieved by way of a data I or data IP operation, the parity is checked by the memory unit. The master device can then be notified if a parity error is detected. That completes our discussion of core memories. Now, let's take a look at semiconductor memory. There is one key point that we'd like to make regarding semiconductor memories. They are non-destructive readout devices. In other words, data can be read from an address location without destroying the data. 
This characteristic eliminates the restore cycle that is required in core memories. Because of non-destructive readout, the access and cycle times in semiconductor memories are approximately equal. Two types of semiconductor memories are available. Metal oxide semiconductor, or MOS, which is pronounced MOS, and bipolar. MOS memories are composed of one-bit semiconductor cells. Each MOS cell can be likened to a small capacitor. It is charged to a certain potential when writing data into it, and then must be recharged periodically to maintain the correct potential. There's another term for this recharging. It's called refreshing the cell. Prior to reading the stored data, the MOS cell must be pre-charged to the correct potential to ensure valid data readout. Note that pre-charging is performed in addition to refreshing. On the other hand, bipolar memories are made of numerous semiconductor flip-flop cells arranged in a matrix. The flip-flops function in the same manner as the conventional flip-flop that you're familiar with. Let's compare MOS and bipolar memories. As we've just noted, MOS memory is similar to a capacitor. It must be refreshed periodically, typically once every millisecond, or the data will be lost. Bipolar memory, on the other hand, is much like a flip-flop. It does not have to be refreshed in order to retain the stored data. MOS memory is slower than its bipolar counterpart. The cycle time for MOS memories is generally in the 450 to 750 nanosecond range, compared to a cycle time of 300 nanoseconds or less for bipolar memory. However, MOS memory costs less than bipolar memory. Also, MOS memory is smaller in size and consumes about one-tenth the operating power of bipolar memory. And lastly, neither MOS memory nor bipolar memory will retain stored data if power is suddenly lost in a system. Up to this point, we've discussed two types of PDP-11 memories, ferrite core memories and semiconductor memories. Read-only memory, which is abbreviated ROM, is a third type of memory that can be used in PDP-11 systems. There are two characteristics that distinguish ROMs from the other types of memories that we've looked at. First of all, the data stored in a ROM is permanent. The data is not erased if power is removed from the computer system. Secondly, because the data is permanent, the CPU can address and read information out of a ROM but it can never perform write operations in order to store data. In some PDP-11 computer systems, read-only memory is an integral part of the CPU. For example, the 1104 and 1134 central processors contain their own read-only memory. This ROM holds diagnostic routines for verifying computer operation. The ROM also holds bootstrap loader programs that are used for starting up the computer system. This is another type of ROM. It is packaged as a separate unit that connects to the PDP-11 Unibus. When this ROM is connected to the Unibus, it can only respond to data IP transfers. It cannot acknowledge data O's, data OB's, and data I's since these data transfers involve a write cycle. This type of read-only memory employs diodes for storage. Each diode represents one bit of data. Each row of 16 diodes is equivalent to 16 bits, or one PDP-11 word. Information can be stored in this type of ROM simply by clipping out specific diodes from the storage matrix. A diode must be removed for each bit position that is to be read as a binary zero. Diodes that are not removed are read as binary ones. In this example, we've removed specific diodes from our ROM in order to store the word 173651. Note that we've only removed diodes from those bit positions that correspond to binary zeros. In effect, the word 173651 has been hardwired into our diode ROM. Up to eight of these diode ROMs can be connected to the Unibus. Each ROM holds 32 words of data. Let's see how we address data words stored in these read-only memories. Bits 9 through 15 of the ROM address are always equal to 773. 
As we saw earlier, addresses below 760000 are part of our addressable memory space. The remaining addresses are reserved for I.O. devices. Hence, the ROM address falls within the space reserved for I.O. devices. What about the other bits that make up the ROM address? Address bits 6, 7, and 8 are always used to select one of the eight possible ROM units. In this example, we have selected the third ROM in the PDP-11 system. Each ROM is pre-wired to recognize a unique combination of address bits 6, 7, and 8. Bits 1 through 5 allow us to address a specific word within the 32-word ROM unit. Note that in a ROM, we address words only. We cannot address bytes. As we've seen earlier, all word addresses are even numbered. Consequently, the least significant ROM address bit, in other words, bit 0, is always a binary 0. Several pre-programmed ROMs are available. These read-only memories contain a series of loading instructions which are executed by the processor. These instructions cause the processor to automatically read in programs from input devices and deposit these programs into memory so they can be executed. Pre-programmed ROMs eliminate the need to manually read in certain programs by way of the switches on the processor's console. In other words, without pre-programmed ROMs, it would be necessary to manually enter each instruction in a program using the console switches. With a pre-programmed ROM, the operator simply specifies the ROM's starting address using the appropriate switches on the PDP-11 console. The operator then presses the console's load address and start switches to initiate automatic read-in of the program. The paper tape bootstrap loader is a typical pre-programmed ROM. Let's take a minute or so to explain what a bootstrap loader program is. When a computer system is first installed, its memory does not contain any meaningful information. The computer knows absolutely nothing, not even how to accept input data. However, we must have some way of loading programs into blank memory. That's the purpose of our ROM bootstrap loader. It contains hardwired loading instructions that enable the processor to deposit input data in its memory. This particular ROM causes the PDP-11 processor to automatically read in programs punched on paper tape in order to get our system started. Now, let's take a look at some of the other pre-programmed ROMs. We also have a pre-programmed ROM that reads in programs from bulk storage devices such as disks or deck tape. Hardwired instructions in this read-only memory allow the processor to retrieve a program stored on a disk or deck tape and load the program into memory. Program transfer begins at location zero of the bulk storage device and the program is loaded into consecutive memory locations starting at location zero. When the transfer is successfully completed, the ROM program jumps back to memory location zero. This permits automatic starting of the actual program deposited in memory. There is also a pre-programmed ROM, which takes programs stored on punch cards or mark sense cards and deposits the information in memory. The program can then be started automatically once it has been loaded into memory. Thus far, we have looked at three examples of pre-programmed ROMs. Each of these ROMs has its own unique set of addresses. Thus, if we wish to use the paper tape bootstrap loader, we set the ROM's starting address to 773000. Other pre-programmed ROMs are available besides those which we have listed here. You can find information on these ROMs in your PDP-11 peripherals handbook. Well, that wraps up our discussion of PDP-11 addressing and memory organization. Before you go on to the next study unit, we would like you to take another self-scoring test. Based on your test results, either review the material covered in this study unit or proceed to the next study unit in this series. When you hear the next tone, turn off the playback unit and take the test located in your workbook. <laughs>